So welcome everyone to this uh, last tutorial uh, of uh, Space 2020 conference. Uh, that will uh, be a bit different than the previous four. Yeah, not completely. So because like we we get close to uh, also uh, looking into side channel attacks, like uh, as like as you all did yesterday. But we're gonna be here uh, looking more into physical uh, attacks, like uh, when when you observe leakages like power consumption and EM. And uh, this part is is mainly introducing this this kind of leakages and um, mentioning kind of state of the art uh, attacks and uh, kind of getting you up to speed for uh, for what's coming later on. Uh, I will explain also what profiled attacks are and uh, uh, how do we uh, do them in the classical way, like using template, something that yeah that is known for say many years. But if you're familiar with that, you can then uh, safely still uh, have a nap if you're in Europe for another hour, because the deep learning part actually only starts from 9.15. So just some heads up uh, in, in case you're still not sure whether uh, whether you had enough sleep. Uh, yeah, anyway, as you know, uh, deep learning, or we could say even AI, uh, is becoming indispensable in, in all kinds of application from robotics, uh, uh, language processing, and security is not exception. And then, of course, hardware security the same. And uh, like there are so many, many things also where uh, deep learning nowadays assists to side channel analysis process, like starting from uh, pre-processing, from leakage evaluation, all the way to attacks. So what we are zooming in here today is really just very, very small fragment of uh, many ways in which deep learning is nowadays present in this topic. So yeah, I hope you, you get an idea. And if you're interested, we're of course always happy to uh, discuss it further. So sorry, I jumped a bit. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna uh, be happy to, um, to receive questions anytime. And because at the moment I don't see my um, chat because I did full screen, I didn't open another computer. So maybe Shivam, if you if you interrupt me, that's completely fine. Just keep an eye on those questions, or if you prefer, also after uh, after this part uh, of tutorial uh, in Discord or Zoom, both is fine. So let's uh, move on. This is uh, uh, the outline of uh, of my talk. So we're gonna start with some introduction. Then I will say a few words about simple power analysis, which was kind of, uh, which came before uh, what is nowadays more referred to as horizontal attacks. Uh, and then just a few words on non-profiled attacks, because that's what people are um, mainly familiar with. So like a DPA or a maybe more specific CPA, so differential power and analysis. And then we'll, we'll, we'll get to profile attacks, uh, in particular templates. And uh, there I'm going to uh, deal with some special terms that are here just briefly mentioned. But yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, uh, go in detail later on. So POIs are points of interest, multivariate Gaussian estimation and detection. OK, so uh, the challenge is known. So how, how, how did we come uh, to, to this? Uh, like uh, the, this fact that side channel analysis is so important today. Um, yeah, so I mean, in the past two decades in general, so we have all these uh, embedded crypto devices that uh, implement cryptography in, uh, in kind of very uh, constrained and, uh, and challenging um, conditions and especially resources on like uh, memory, power, energy, and so on are, are sometimes very sparse. And due to this fact, it's like really, really sometimes a big challenge to, to, to implement secure crypto on these small devices. And that's like uh, one thing that, that, that makes uh, uh, the uh, physical attacks possible because of course, uh, to implement countermeasures, it's becoming even more difficult. And the other thing is, is coming from the fact that those devices are, uh, are kind of available out there and the adversary can simply monitor communication uh, uh, between devices and, and readers and so on. So it's kind of a known challenge that, that, that we became aware of already, like as academia in the mid nineties with the uh, famous attacks uh, published by Paul Kocher on timing and power analysis. Uh, and that's kind of uh, 
where this this whole area officially kicked off we could say so so basically we are discussing now implementation attacks that are uh, possible due to the weaknesses in implementations so so typically there is nothing wrong with with, with crypto algorithms like those are uh, known as secure and and kind of mathematically uh, solid enough to 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 not be able to to uh, to to break them easily at least so it's the way they get implemented due to the constraints I just uh, mentioned or like just uh, yeah sometimes uh, not so good engineering so here you see uh, typically we have timing side channel uh, here is the setup uh, for um, for power side channel and this is like a setup for fault injection so those are implementation attacks as uh, people typically uh, mention um yes so relevance yeah uh i, I guess just showing few recent uh, announcements uh, in the news on side channel attacks on real devices and also on crypto so those three were, were from 2019 i'm not gonna talk about them you can google uh, the terms it's very easy to get a lot of information about because each uh, were published also as academic papers uh, so I, I, I selected those uh, four. So this is the fourth one. So this is from this year. And actually, Yuval is uh, in, uh, in, in Zoom, so he can tell you more about that because he's one of the co-authors of this ladder leak uh, about side channel flaws uh, with implementations of elliptic curve uh, signature uh, implementations, in particular when you use Montgomery ladder. So that's why the, 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 the ladder leak uh, term. Uh, so, so all four are attacks on crypto uh, implemented in real world, and I guess uh, the the the, uh, the recent dates also suggest that the problem is far from being solved. Um, so, just to uh, to to introduce the uh, the, the setting uh, we're uh, we're working on. So, basically, black box scenario is what you typically have for crypto. So we have like we uh, envision a crypto function as a black box, which is parameterized with key. Like you can think of it as AES. We have a plain text. We have then AES uh, because it's it's kind of um, like it functions as a black box because you, you you don't get much information. But cipher text and then the typical uh, task of a cryptanalyst is to uh, to to uh, to analyze this crypto system, basically just known on just uh, having the knowledge of plain text and ciphertext pairs, and and that's uh, that's then kind of a different kind of uh, challenge and research than what we are discussing today. So we are now like looking into something that's uh, often re referred to as gray box scenario. So we have plain text and ciphertext and there is this crypto uh, device with the key, but we get some sort of leakage from this device that can be in different uh, in different ways, like from uh, different physical quantities. Uh, and the, the, the leakage comes from the fact that this, uh, this crypto algorithm is running on an actual device. Uh, which can be a microcontroller or some uh, hardware platform like ASIC or FPGA. And we can actually get to measure uh, what's happening in, in the neighborhood. So this and observe these physical quantities. And here the, adver the, uh, uh, ad the adversary's goal is to recover secret key of plain text, not just by using the knowledge of pairs, plain text, ciphertext, but also additional side channel information. And that's what makes it somewhat more feasible. We, because we kind of get additional window into this um, uh, implementation that will help us uh, break the system. So that's how this, this, this whole thing is, is working because we kind of get more than uh, the uh, classical uh, kind of uh, crypt analyst. And examples are timing, power, EM, sound, it just, uh, there are papers out there uh, explaining how you can use any of those uh, side channels. And this is just a just kind of slide for your information that there is much more there in terms of implementation attacks. And uh, uh, the way we, we typically uh, divide them are like we speak about active versus passive uh, with respect to uh, the capabilities of the adversary, if he's able to tamper. So kind of also 
uh, in, in, uh, in, induce some, some glitching uh, or some other uh, uh, kind of additional uh, um, things that, that would make, uh, make her able to exploit some kind of uh, abnormal behavior. So more or less with active attacks, we expect the device is not only uh, behaving according to the spec, uh, while with passive, it simply comes down to eavesdropping. So um, it's it's kind of, um, if it's, for example, EM, if there is antenna hidden, you wouldn't even know that something's going on like a passive, uh, passive attack. And then with respect to invasiveness, so how, uh, how strong techniques uh, the attacker is using, we, we can uh, go from like the most invasive one, like bus probing. Uh, then something in between where you are uh, kind of assuming that the attacker is able to open the chip, but not really damage it. So like sometimes we also do something called decapsulation where you can kind of more easy access the chip by depackaging or like opening the, the, the card and then do all kinds of things starting from reading a memory or a glitching or doing some kind of optical attacks and so on. And then we of course have non-invasive, which are uh, often also low cost, like power, EM, um, also this uh, cold boot and so on. I, I don't have time to talk about all that. This is just kind of uh, sorting them a little bit for you so that you can have like uh, an idea on uh, what's out there. Okay. Yes, sorry. So this is an example of a timing side channel. So this is, uh, yes, that was the next one. So this is uh, uh, th this was the first side channel, and uh, uh, it's it's kind of still uh, present out there in the form of uh, cash attacks, as as you heard yesterday. But this is just a, just a toy example to to uh, to kind of explain the, the the concept and idea. So the fact that um, different uh, computation take different amounts of time. Uh, makes it possible to uh, to learn a lot about all kinds of computation procedure, uh, including uh, secrets and so on. So this is an example uh, for a very say basic implementation of uh, code for pin code verification. And the, the way it's done, you can see it's like simply checking each digit. And if it's correct, uh, then it proceeds. And if it's not, it goes back. So this is something that's obviously very bad idea in terms of uh, constant time implementation, because when you compare the execution times for the following uh, inputs, then you can see that it will be uh, very different from uh, 0, 1, 2, 3 and uh, going on towards 5, 9, 0, 0, because uh, the time will increase as you move on because every time one more digit is becoming correct. So this uh, code is running longer and longer until we have the actual pin. So that's kind of a simple uh, example. Uh, so like I said, this is the earliest uh, and the measurements are uh, kind of easy to uh, collect, but it's also um, assumed to be the easiest to, uh, to combat because like nowadays it's this, uh, um, paradigm of uh, constant time coding is, is mandatory. So you will see with all, say, um, standardized implementations that um, people at least aim at constant time. If it's, uh, the, if, if it's always, if, uh, if they're always able to succeed, that's another thing, but that's at least uh, the idea. And it's not always that easy. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, can also be exploited remotely. There were also papers on that. So over the internet attacking even SSL uh, through timing attacks and can show some also unpredictable effects of caches as you saw yesterday and has been applied to uh, many, many ciphers from both symmetric and, asymm and asymmetric crypto. And this was the first paper. So moving to power side channel. Uh, so I wanna say a few words on the, uh, concepts uh, like why leakage, where does it come from and uh, how do we get to exploit it? So, so basically uh, it, uh, it boils down to the fact that, that, that CMOS is uh, the, the, the main uh, 
uh, circuit style present out there in the chips. And there you have uh, the, um, the structure uh, of a CMOS inverter being the, the, the main building block in, in all those transistors. And as they switch, so like you have like on, on the left side, we see that basically what inverter does, if, uh, if input is one, then it goes to zero. So uh, output becomes uh, uh, discharged through capacitor and we get zero or the other way around. So basically switching activity is the, the, the main one that cause uh, power uh, consumption. So that's kind of is the, the main concept and the main idea. So basically due to the fact that uh, computation will leak the most and especially uh, when we get switching activities so from zero to one and one to zero. So that immediately suggests the fact that power consumption is actually data dependent because if you can measure dynamic power consumption you are basically measuring the amount of those transitions and that will immediately allow the adversary to model this uh, power side channel and um, that's basically what we want to do by uh, doing power analysis. So this is actually uh, the, uh, the formula for dynamic power and um, it, it really explains uh, the way uh, things are happening with CMOS and you can see that uh, this the dependency on uh, the dynamic power on transitions will exactly help us model it and accordingly attack crypto implementations. So we want to model the leakage. And there we typically speak about two different uh, leakage models. The first one is Hamming distance, where we just count these number of transitions. And we, for a moment, assume that they consume the same amount of power, which is not always the case. But I say for, for our model is good enough. Uh, so say assume we have a hardware implementation there you typically have a register here R that will store the result of an AS whole round. And say if first the value was V0 after this round has been computed, it's, being, it's getting overwritten by another value V1 after this uh, AS round completed. So what will happen in, in terms of uh, power uh, resulting uh, after this computation. So we'll basically uh, compute power or model it based on the number of those transitions that occurred when switching from V0 to V1. So basically we need the number of bit flips, which is actually just the Hamming distance of those two values, V0 and V1. And then we can compute it as XOR and then Hamming weight on it, right? So this is typical model for hardware implementations. So FPGA and ASIC implementation, you can uh, leakage model, uh, you can model the, the, the leakage based on this uh, concept. So Hamming distance. Um, let's look at software implementation. So uh, typically there is a microcontroller where we have register A and B say, and then, um, there is a, again value V0, but now we uh, we have additional CPU and this microcontroller bus. So things are slightly working differently than in hardware. And say typical instruction mob RBRA will move the content of A to B, but that will all happen over this bus. And then uh, those are typically pre-charged. So what happens is that uh, you just have to 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 to, to basically take state as the previous one was zero. So if we um, consider it with respect to the Hamming distance uh, idea uh, from, from, from the hardware implementation, so it's basically the same, but now bus initial value is zero. So you basically have to only take into account Hamming weight of V0 of this value that has to be copied from one register to another, okay? And it's quite common model for software implementation. So we could say with these two models, we, we cover almost all um, uh, crypto implementations out there. And of course there are other models, but these two are really, really kind, kind of the most 
the two most common ones and and they usually work very well for uh, for attacks so then if it works then why change it so that's kind of sometimes reasoning that why would we uh, be looking into better models if we have those that work very well um to, to show you some actual setups so there is a face setup and then you can see um that is a target i think it's it's very small maybe to identify it, but we will show it later on it's just a uh the pinata board uh with the sd uh microcontroller uh, uh, uh with arm cortex m4 that will also be used later in some slides so you will see it better and then we have typical uh uh, equipment to induce faults like uh, like uh, like VC glitcher uh, that uh, is kind of doing voltage glitching to uh, to induce some disturbances to this uh, computation that would lead to a wrong result. We have EM based glitching with a transient probe and then a picoscope current probe and so on. The tempest setup on the top uh, right corner is something that I will also uh, mention later on. So now just for your information and the typical DPA setup uh, with ARM Cortex M4. Again, uh, you see the, the, the same board as, on the, as in the setup below, uh, which is also decapsulated so that we can easily uh, tamper and uh, eavesdrop on those uh, power lines. Um, and then, yeah, uh, typical for hardware implementation, we use FPGA board. Uh, that uh, is uh, produced by Sakura, typically for side channel analysis. It's a very good platform because you have also a control and uh, uh, it's, it's kind of already prepared for actual side channel attacks. Uh, with respect to capabilities, we, we uh, usually distinguish between simple and differential attacks like kind of the, the, the basic division, because you, you, you just wanna kind of consider uh, the amount of uh, observations that the adversary gets. And, and also what's, what's even more important is the use case, like uh, is the key, the same key used over and over again, then you are typically in this uh, differential attack scenario. But yeah, that's uh, kind of a real world uh, looking uh, would only fit the um, kind of um, encryption with the same key use case and also uh, static key exchange with public key crypto. But simple power analysis is, is also like uh, one of the first introduced where you simply from just a few measurements could learn uh, some information about uh, the algorithm, about sometimes uh, instructions processed or even sometimes data if they are instruction related. Um, and um, nowadays we have horizontal attacks that kind of use the similar idea from SPA. So with horizontal attacks, you usually use one trace because like if you can think, if you think of like ephemeral keys and uh, all these real world applications that, that use some kind of randomization. So uh, quite often you get only one trace to, to, uh, to attack. Um, so if, uh, if within that trace, you, you can kind of identify different, different uh, parts of the trace that are data dependent. And the, if there is the same data process uh, within the same trace, that's kind of the idea that you could exploit for horizontal attacks. Uh, differential attacks, uh, again, also very uh, well known uh, from, from early days. Uh, they use statistic signal processing and typically require many, many measurements, especially nowadays with the state of the art countermeasures, like people, people will go uh, up to millions of measurements uh, and then uh, be able to maybe perform successful DPA. Uh, then we, of course, taking into account countermeasures that are higher order attacks, uh, where we distinguish also uh, between univariate and multivariate, depending on how many uh, time points uh, you take into account. Um, those would be all be mainly uh, unprofiled, but we want to focus today on profiled, which are tip, uh, template attacks, and more recently, all kinds of machine learning and deep learning attacks. Uh, and then there are uh, all kinds of ideas to combine side, different side channels, to, to combine side channel uh, attacks with theoretical cryptanalysis and so on. Okay. 
so SPA. So there is a, a like very simple example for us uh, for uh, SPA. Like if you consider the um, textbook RSA implementation using uh, um, square and multiply, there typically uh, if if you if it's implemented like in a straightforward way, what you get is that for every bit uh, there is a squaring taking place. You can see it here. And if the, the if the bit is one, then you also do multiplication. But there is a big difference with respect to uh, computation done in one and the other case, obviously. So it's also timing leak, but of course it's also power consumption leak because it's either you compute square or both square and multiply. Mm -hmm. And the idea is this, this will be uh, easily exploited. And that is the case because we have the exponent dependent branch. Okay. And that, uh, looking into power trace would sometimes look like this. So when there is zero, there is uh, much less going on. So you also don't see this significant peak as with one. And, and, and even if there is some misalignment, like this is the same trace, you can still uh, recognize the same pattern, but now it's just taking place a, a bit later on. And there is a way around that would be say, simply RSA implemented via square and multiply always. So fixing it by just doing always square and multiply. So for every bit, both uh, implement, both uh, operations take place, but the, uh, but the one uh, uh, that, um, sorry. So depending on the bit, we, we store the result or one or the other. Right, so we here monitor this as index variable that will take the bit of uh, of the exponent scanned, and if the bit was zero, we'll take the uh, the the value in R zero register. If the bit was one, we'll take the R one. So basically, we fixed some things like it's gonna take the same um, the same timing in 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 each uh, loop computation, but there is still a leak here. There is still possibility to uh, attack this implementation to be a via side channel. Um, yeah, now it's 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 very hard to to do this through online tutorials. Like in, uh, if we were somewhere like in a in a room, I we we would be typically asking questions, and one of you would be hopefully answering. But yeah, now it's it's just not not the same. It's not uh, as good as 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 uh, physical um, teaching, but okay. So anyway, Tell, uh, would, you, would you like to take two questions we have in the chat? Yes, now? yes, sure, sure. Go ahead. Okay, so uh, so uh, what the first question is uh, from Aditya Arun Kumar, uh, who says, uh, by theoretical crypt analysis, does it mean there is an exhaustive key space search or mutual information based theoretical modeling of the hardware under test? Okay, so uh, good question. I, I was not very, uh, uh, very clear there. So by theoretical cryptanalysis there, we mean not, yeah, like exhaustive key search. So, so what classical cryptanalysts do by, so given some uh, bits uh, uh, from side channel attack, then a theoretical cryptanalysis can become more feasible, right? So you kind of combine the efforts on two ends. From side channel, you recover a certain amount of bits that make then your your key search uh, space feasible. Okay. And uh, the second question is: Are DPA SPA applicable to low voltage devices operating at zero point two or zero point three volts, for example? Um, uh, sorry, are they ap applicable to? To uh, low voltage devices which are operating at zero point two or zero point three volts. Hmm. Yeah, I would say yes. It, it may be more challenging in terms of um, signal processing, and, and maybe like you, you need to, to, to do some um, some noise elimination and signal amplification. So maybe it requires more engineering skills. But I would say yes. Uh, in principle, yes. So there is always a way to. To, to monitor side channels. So people are also performing successful side channel uh, uh, and DPA attacks on like 
uh, nanotechnology devices. So I was basically speaking mostly about CMOS, where we have as the dominant source of power consumption dynamic power. But with, with nanotechnologies, there is more like leakage power also that uh, that consumes power. So that, that technology consumes power even if there is no computation. So that is becoming, say, more challenging in terms of modeling. But nevertheless, there are uh, there are papers and, and research ongoing showing that it's that it's still possible. So there is always kind of this dependency of uh, of side channel information of from data that that uh, that you can uh, exploit. Well, I think we're done with the questions. Okay, so let's move on. So we were talking about uh, the. Uh, the side channel uh, information that's available here. And uh, I, I will just say what it is. So, so basically the fact that you don't, uh, that, that, that you take the result of one or the other register can be monitored more locally. Uh, sometimes we uh, refer to it as say location-based attacks. So if you are kind of uh, able to put, for example, antenna on one of the two registers, R0 or R1, and then just per loop see which one uh, is, is activated at, at certain uh, uh, instruction execution, then you also know in a way which bit was processed. But that's a non-standard maybe uh, side channel information at the moment. So location-based leakage. Okay, so just to, to kind of give you an idea uh, uh, of how many things are out there. And uh, yeah, uh, the... the um, uh, see of options that the adversary gets to exploit. Um, so power attacks are, are well known, uh, very powerful, uh, usually typically require proximity, but then the, the upgrade would be a, a, a EM attacks, so electromagnetic emanation uh, leakage based that are also sometimes uh, uh, recovering the same leakage like power in kind of differential way. Uh, uh, of attacking and with location-based leakage could uh, uh, could get even more. And of course, countermeasures are required on, on all levels. So you can think of first algorithm. So we were talking about having uh, all constant time and so on that's typically already considered on this level. Then implementation level. So when you think about it's gonna go on a, a specific platform, like, I don't know, uh, like a Java card or microcontroller or a, ASIC, then, then you have to consider additional countermeasures that are sometimes platform specific. Uh, and, and even all the way down to transistor level. So one of the uh, very intensively researched countermeasures is special logic styles that consume always the same amount of power. So that's that was uh, very uh, extensively done maybe 15 years ago. But at the end of the day, it's, it's still considered not feasible because the overhead becomes just too big for like uh, small devices, okay? And then there are some uh, papers to consider. So the, the, the first uh, paper uh, introducing DPA by Kocher and also I mentioned here the first uh, paper on real world uh, device that was uh, in already in 2008. And nowadays there are like thousands, I don't know, hundreds of thousands maybe. Um, Okay, a, a few words on EM because that's that's very common nowadays uh, due to the fact that we have all these devices that communicate uh, uh, remotely and um, um, so things are becoming slightly more complicated because you have all kinds of signals due to system on chips uh, platforms uh, where where we have all these capacitors, peripherals, and so on. And there are always some countermeasures there that try to, to make it at least things more difficult for the adversary. So this is an example of like um, uh, SCADA based of um, platform for critical infrastructure. So you, you, you already see how, how challenging can be to, to, to get the actual signal there. But, but nevertheless, uh, these attacks are also done and uh, there is quite some research going on on that. So in, in principle, not just SCADA kind of critical infrastructure, but also in general, all IoT devices typically are also target of side channel attacks. Um, and then of course you need a probe with EM 
Uh, so these are kind of uh, examples for EM setup. So you can see uh, this um, pinata board on the right side and in, in an actual setup on the left. So you can see that it's uh, decapsulated. So there is this, this hole on top, which makes it easier to, uh, to collect EM emanations. And, and, and it's, it's just kind of um, considering this, um, this worst case uh, scenario. So kind of the strongest possible attacker. So that's, uh, that's kind of sometimes useful to, to, um, to examine. Uh, because that corresponds to, say, security evaluation lab um, uh, use cases. Okay. Um, that brings us back to this location-based leakages. So uh, we are able, in this case, when we decapsulate, uh, to kind of zoom into uh, an actual platform and to, to find where the activities of certain chips, uh, certain chip parts are taking place. So here you can see uh, based on the heat map where exactly is uh, computation taking place. So this is actually now zooming into uh, location-based leakage, okay? Uh, the Tempest I already uh, mentioned before, so now just a few words. So this that's uh, known for, for decades, it was, um, a code name for uh, for for the uh, U.S. government project, uh, based on the fact that uh, all screens emanate EM that can be then read from from the distance uh, using all kinds of setups and, and probes and so on. So this is kind of basic idea, uh, but we have also nowadays our own in the lab that is collecting information from a mobile phone. So this is what we call screen gleaning attack. And you can see the typical use case would be when you receive on your phone or any other mobile device like, a, like your a tablet or something, you receive sometimes a secret code as a, as a, as a way to authenticate, to, to do some payments or uh, to, uh, to uh, or other kinds of services and so on. And then uh, the fact that you are the only one that sees it makes uh, sometimes people believing that it's actually secure. So with this kind of setup that's using the, um, the uh, uh, SDR device, so software defined radio, uh, we were able to, to collect by, by uh, EM antenna uh, information in the form of, this is, this is here, we call this uh, image from electromagnetic image. And, and there you can see that you get kind of uh, uh, a fingerprint of this uh, screen in 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 the sense from taking it from side channel leaked information, and and then we use CNN classifier and deep learning. So this is another use case from deep learning to recover the code. So the code is even not visible to the uh, to, to, to the eye, bare eye, but uh, deep learning then helps in um, recovering the information and. Um, and the, the data like uh, digits or, or even words and so on. So typically that's something that deep learning classifiers are very good at recovering uh, 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 images and text and all kinds of things. Okay, so to summarize, uh, yeah, side channels are uh, causing uh, problems uh, everywhere. So uh, that's basically the, uh, the the main business model for security evaluation labs, the, the fact that it's not so easy to have secure implementations with respect to, to physical attacks. They are typically passive and there we use um, power EM, but there are also other like uh, this photonic side channel was also uh, it kind of invented some, some years back and so on. So there is just, many, uh, so much to, to talk about that it's, that it's very hard to, to kind of summarize it all properly. But let's say just a few words on non-profile because I promised to speak about templates and the time is, is going on very fast. So this is still the most popular side channel attack. And it's uh, kind of something that, that is performed everywhere. Um, 
because the idea is to use statistic to use a large number of power measurement and uh, also called traces and sometimes it's combined or even replaced with some leakage evaluation technology uh, methodology like tvla which basically uh, also use is using statistics to evaluate uh, whether there is leakage in in certain implementation or not and that's would say be maybe getting giving more information than if you perform a DPA with some specific distinguisher, because then you can conclude that this specific attack works or not, but then we don't know what would be with other attacks. So we have no information uh, more general, okay? Okay, yeah, this is just the idea. Uh, when when using correlation uh, power analysis, where the so-called side channel distinguisher is Pearson correlation coefficient. So basically what you do, what the adversary does, is to compare real side channel information and actual outputs with model of side channel. And remember, we talked about Hemming weight and distance being used for this, um, for this uh, uh, concept. So we have to say, based on key hypothesis, compute also hypothetical output and use the model. And then our statistics is just basically telling us whether hypothesis is correct or not. So the model is there to identify the correct key hypothesis, our leakage model. And that's, that's kind of the concept, but like to, to explain actually how this works would probably be another half an hour. So we're just going to move on to profile the text. Um, so any questions now, uh, now, maybe before we start with profiling? Shivam? Uh, yes, I'm checking the, the chat. There is one question. This mm -hmm. is uh, in the case of uh, electromagnetic probe. Uh, so there is a, a clear link between uh, probe tip size uh, so is there any logic with which one can actually solidify the relationship between the probe size and the chip size? Hmm. Like, a, like a common logic where you could say this one goes, yeah, uh, I, I, I find it very hard to answer. I think it's, it's, it's really more like telecommunication um, uh, theory problem you know, people designing antennas for, for specific kinds of signals. There is also the, the issue of different uh, uh, field in terms of EM. So it could be like near field, far field, and so on. So I think it's it's very uh, complex problem. And it really depends on the, the, the kind of information you want to uh, pick up. And also, I would say, uh, maybe not size, but also what matters sometimes is like uh, uh, the shape of antennas. So th there were also papers looking into kind of uh, different um, different forms, different materials, uh, like making your own antenna, what would be the, the, the best one to, to pick up certain signals. So yeah, very uh, complex question, I would say. Okay. Okay, so let's move on to, 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 to template uh, attacks. And, and first, to motivate them, I would like you to consider this, uh, this scenario of uh, like a typical implementation. Say, think of it as uh, maybe AES. So we have some input and, and key that's, that's being also updated. And then there is this S box layer, and the output of it is Y that's then uh, taken further. And let's say that key is uh, refreshed before every encryption. That's kind of nice countermeasure against DPA. And uh, obviously, classical CPA or DPA would not work in this case, because there you rely on, on this statistics that that is basically uh, taking advantage of the fact that the same key is used over and over again. But if this is not the case, then we have to, to do something else. And, and you remember we talked about SPA, but that's also not so easy, uh, especially for symmetric crypto, because things are just happening too fast to be able to, to observe uh, many things in, 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 a, in a single trace or something. But then we can do template attacks. So 
first give some assumptions. So let's say we have still this leakage model. So it's it's always very important, this leakage model. I hope you, you, you get that uh, message. Um, we are now just focusing on, on this SBOX output. So kind of zooming into, into one, uh, one special scenario. And we assume for a moment that leakage is univariate, which means we know exactly in which moment to, to, to look for this leakage. And uh, uh, that's just say at the moment one time point. Okay. So the idea is that uh, typically real world devices will be protected and uh, we will also not be able to, 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 uh, to do much, but just observe and trace. But we quite often know the device and we can get a copy uh, which can be open, open copy in terms of you can program it, you can put your own uh, data on it, you can change input, you can change keys, you can kind of get to, 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 to learn from it. And, and that's where we proceed with like something called uh, template building. So we try to profile certain information, either like a, a key, uh, key bytes or uh, some other uh, sub key um, um, information or instruction or, or whatever that will really depend on the actual use case you want to attack. So we're going to use this first uh, uh, and, uh, open copy to create templates. So that's template building. And then we will, after this phase, go after actual device, which can be protected uh, and typically will be to do template matching. And that's just the general structure. I will explain it in, in a very slow way, say kind of from very simple example. So if we assume say there is transmitter sending uh, a bit one, uh, zero or one to receiver and we can encode them with uh, different uh, uh, amounts of volts. So we can zero is encoded as zero and one is five. And there is always some noise there. So that's why we, we kind of really have to, 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 to work hard sometimes in this also template building. And the fact that we are dealing with models makes also the impact of noise much more relevant. But the task of receivers is to decide which one is that. And, and typically you know how it works. If it's like very close to, to those values, you can easily uh, conclude which one was that, but if it's something in between, like say 3.15, then we can say, yeah, it's it's more likely that it's one, right? Um, so this is uh, basically the, the, the idea, very simple idea that leads us to this so-called reduced template building. So we could say send 1000 times uh, same bit. So that's what we actually do with templates and measure the voltage. And then we, by computing the mean of this, of those thousand signals, we basically find the representation of this zero bit. And we can do the same for bit one and compute the mean, and then we have our two templates, right? T0 and T1. And then simple procedure for uh, matching is just after observing a measurement to compute these scores, and the one that gets a higher value uh, will tell us if this bit was zero or one. So that's kind of very, very simple idea. And here is just kind of more formally explained, not just if you have uh, uh, zero, but in principle, any random variable. So we can just create a template based on this bit and then match a measurement by using uh, the, this score. Okay, so how does that relate to side channels? So here we again model measurement as one random variable. But now we have also a number of samples that we now uh, form as, uh, as one random vector. This capital L stands for leakage. So we have this, this random vector that collects all these samples, uh, one, two, up to some number of samples that can be thousands or hundreds of thousands. But now for the uh, for the uh, simplicity, uh, we just assume that it's something short, like we have these values for leakage. Okay, and then we want to build templates. So we just take this empty uh, or like open device and we encrypt 
uh, a number of times with the same key, so-called key zero. And then we all the time measure traces and then we compute the template for this key, okay? Then we do the same for another key. You can think of it also as one bit of the key. That's what it's kind of suggested here because we only have, we only have zero or one, but that's also kind of a, a procedure that then can be uh, iteratively repeated on, on all other uh, bits or, or sub keys and so on. So we compute the template for the other one. And then the matching is simply as we did before, observe a trace, and then we match to one of the two by computing the scores. Okay, so, so far there was no model. It was basically that the model was that zero is different than one. And that's also say a valid leakage model. We just never formulated it in, uh, in, in, in this way before when we talked about Heming, Heming weight and Heming distance. But that's basically the model that's uh, implicitly uh, assumed by the distance of means DPA, where you kind of partition your um, power traces based on uh, one single bit that you consider as uh, like testing uh, your key hypothesis. And then you just for zero, you put data traces, all the power traces in one set and for one on the other. So simple model is just zero, does not consume the same amount of power as one. But here we have to, to, to basically go for something uh, say more complicated typically. So this was just a very simple example. And there we will use probability density functions that are, as you know, used in, in all kinds of applications with, the, um, with statistics, with the population um, estimates, um, representations and so on, but can be also used for um, side channel attacks. And then, for example, Gaussian distribution is something that's that's very commonly used and very popular. So if you want to express uh, the, 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 the weight of population, then we typically represent it with a mean and the variance. So you have this representation here. And then we can also, we will see how to, how do we do that in, in, in practice. And there is one simple example from this game Dota 2. I guess most of you know it. So we want to use this Gaussian distribution to represent some outcomes of this game. So there were four matches with um, uh, each with specific number of deaths. So that's that's apparently what this game is about. I don't really know how it works, but anyway, maybe you do. Um, so we want to now estimate these um, parameters, so mean and the variance. And for that, we use something called maximum likelihood estimation. So basically, we assume that uh, there is a distribution where we want to find these parameters. And in, in this, in our example, we're gonna use uh, for theta, this mean and standard deviation. So we just compute from the data that you saw before. And then, um, then we get, sorry. Uh, try to try to, to fit our data set by computing this parameter. So there is mean and there is sigma. So these are the values for this experiment. So how to relate this to templates? We have uh, something known as binary hypothesis testing, where we know that one of the two is true. And this is, if you think about the, 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 the crypto use case, this is quite commonly the case that you want to see whether uh, target bit is zero or one. But I want to explain it first with respect to, to, to other say known applications. So we can have like a, a radar uh, detection. So see when it's plane or, or no plane, that's military application. Uh, in amusement park, you can decide uh, based on this hypothesis testing whether the ticket was paid or not. Uh, with transmitting data, we saw zero bit zero or one and with crypto can be key, key zero or key one. And we always have four possible outcomes. So we basically have uh, to decide age zero if it's true. So that would be the correct choice. To decide true uh, to, uh, age zero if it was H1. So basically that's false negative. We have also false positive and we have H1 if it was H1. So that's correct choice. So you have correct choice in two of those use cases. And the remaining two that are not correct can be either false negative or false positive. 
and then just to uh, to consider what it actually means uh, these type one or two errors for um, for those four applications. So as 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 you may imagine, it's it's quite different for different applications. And for military, it can be really serious issue in uh, in, in in both cases, like either space airspace violation or or more expenses. Uh, with entertainment a park can be say maybe less um, drastic, but still can uh, kind of cause some uh, undesired effects. But with crypto is actually very similar. It just we don't care about uh, type of error it is. It's it's like from the adversary perspective, it's just whether you guess correct a bit or not. And this is the idea that's basically used in, an, in detection theory. So we have a source, we have this probabilistic transition mechanism, and then observation and decision rule uh, that is not always kind of one-to-one -one matching. So that's why it's kind of with, with a lot of signals, a lot of noise going on, that is kind of not one-to-one -one matching from observation and decision. And that's why we have all these errors types one and two uh, mentioned as mentioned before. So I want just to, to, to say a few words on, 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 on this uh, so-called Bayes criterion. So we have with uh, observation and decision, you have, you, you see here that it's different in terms of space they cover in this uh, 2D observation space. And, and those intersection between the two is what we get as type one and type two. And for us, just the kind of the main message is that there is not always perfect partitioning. And that's why we always have this kind of uh, issue of dealing with noise and, and kind of identi identifying the correct assumptions and uh, correct hypothesis, which will for crypto use cases mean correct keys. But that's uh, basically how, how we build our templates that are based on these statistics and the fact that by repeating certain observations uh, and, uh, and, 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 and processing many traces, we get actually good representative of what is like a, bit zero say information or key zero information. So building templates is, is heavily dependent on how you model your, your, your space, your hypothesis space, and how you deal with probability distribution functions. And that's basically, um, yeah, something that, that probably many people know from, from your say, um, high school or, uh, or uh, university statistics, but now we are trying to to, to reflect at it in, in this context of template attacks. And, and these are just formulas how you can compute one or the other. I don't want to, uh, to talk about that. I just want to explain now finally how we compute templates because that's what you need for your example today. So finally, the score in this kind of more general setting is a likelihood ratio test that we compute with this lambda. And then just computing probabilities uh, or ratio of those two distributions for each observation, okay? And those, those uh, are now gonna be matched through template matching in this univer univariate Gaussian model by using for each key, so computing corresponding univariate Gaussian distribution. Uh, you can see these two here for key zero and key one. And then we finally have to check which of the two matches test observation the best. And that's how we compute our score. So this lambda of R. And if it's uh, higher than one, then it's key zero. If it's uh, smaller than one, then it's key one. So that's just basically uh, computing um, the score as before, but now for two assumptions, okay? So we showed how to use PDFs for templates and how to build them. And then finally, uh, template matching for this univariate Gaussian model. Again, reminding you that univariate means uh, considering just one point of interest. Uh, there are a few more slides showing this for multivariate and I will just go quickly over that. Um, maybe just to, to, to check with, uh, with the chair, if there are changes. 
in in terms of other questions to deal with so because i i see no one and i hear no, further question here. no questions uh, no further questions after the month okay so stepan maybe quickly to check with you how flexible are you uh well <laughs> i i can be flexible as, as needed okay yeah just just maybe sure, spending sure, five to ten continue. minutes more sure continue yeah yeah it's just always a challenge to 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 say uh, everything you want to but okay let's try yeah very quickly uh, uh we can share the slides and you will then be able to to see what you need for uh, for the exercise coming up so now we will look into something more real, so multivariate Gaussian distribution, which which basically yeah, this is this is in in, in 3D space. Uh, basically, now we are considering more uh, time points, and we want to build templates by using this multivariate Gaussian distribution. And then uh, we will explain the uh, both phases, so templates building and detection or template matching. So. Um, the idea. We have to first uh, kind of say how do we do these things around points of interest. So that's that's kind of a research question for itself. And there are many, many um, ways to do that. So typically it's a kind of heuristic, but there are different approaches to how people have dealt with it in the past. So there is, of course, difference of means heuristic which basically is assuming that for two keys, we can just use the traces uh, for each to compute mean and the same for, for the other key. And then we just compute the difference basically. Uh, and there where the difference is the highest. So we, we can take of course absolute value here. That's kind of doesn't make a big difference, but then basically this will suggest what are the most relevant point for uh, leakage, because that's where you have the highest difference uh, from key uh, zero to key one. Okay. Then there is also sum of square differences. That's uh, the same, but then just computing the, 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 the uh, square. Uh, there is standard deviation computation, CPA, PCA. Uh, and even nowadays, um, machine learning and deep learning techniques to find best points of interest. Um, as already said, I, I'm not intentionally going into this deep learning part because that's something that Stepan will, if I let him do today. But yeah, let's, uh, let's focus on finishing this one. So this is now just basically giving a generalized formula uh, from, uh, from before. So where we explained for univariate Gaussian PDFs, now we are in, in this multivariate Gaussian setting. For a number of points of interest here, we denote it as M. So there is this computation taking place. The, this is the exponential function and some matrices because you have obviously um, more uh, points, more time samples. And the leakage vector, you remember before, we were just using two values, uh, so the mean and the uh, variance, but now because it's multi-dimensional, we end up with the mean vector and covariance matrix. So yeah, it, it's really just extending the, the basic concept from say two dimension to two more. And that implies just some more computation. And basically instead of scalars, we are dealing with uh, vectors and matrices. And yeah, other than that, it's, it's not a big deal. So, Computation is here, so you have to compute this multivariate Gaussian PDFs for a number of points, as already said, and then we have this mean vector computed as the mean uh, over all vectors, and the covariance matrix is also the transposed computation of these. And the same we do for all key candidates. After all, yeah, of course, each for each you, you, uh, of the keys, you have to collect a number of traces, say n. Uh, we say n, so that can be, say, thousands or more, depending on like how, how difficult with respect to noise is, is your um, device, how 
challenging computation uh, is in terms of um, um, are there countermeasures? Um, is it software or hardware? So there are all kinds of consideration that would be um, decisive when, uh, uh, when when kind of uh, choosing the value for n or uh, or m and so on. And then we compute the templates in the same way. So now it's just actually the uh, the, the vectors, not uh, scalars anymore. And uh, this is again template matching in the same way. So after observing the actual trace to attack, we have to match it to one of the templates for key zero and key one or more if needed. But now we are kind of trying to, to simplify by um, confronting just two, two keys. And now we have the same test, but multivariate. So again, this is lambda uh, for this actual trace that's computed as this expression. So yeah, you will see later on, we have the, uh, the, the MATLAB code to compute this. So then you can try to, uh, to match all uh, variables and computations. And now the, the, the really, really very last thing, but I'm just gonna say what challenges are and then uh, maybe we can we can still discuss it later on. So, of course, how to select number of points? It's it's like so obviously like one would think the best is to have more points, but then you will end up with really very computationally challenging problems. But kind of yeah, that's uh, that's that's a trade off as 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 often you have, you get like more computation and, and more uh, even traces in the same way as, as, as time points will probably give you better results, but then you will end up with something that takes much more time and much more resources. So there is heuristics that exist, but it's kind of a trade-off. So not an easy answering question. Uh, what where computation is very slow. That's also typically a problem with templates. That's why we also uh, went to machine learning and deep learning. So that's one of the reasons. So there are many, many kind of not so nice things with all these matrices, with like co computing uh, like complex templates and, and, and these PDFs and so on. So typically there is a simple trick to forget this term because it's constant, uh, to take uh, the log because uh, it's exponent function. So that will be much easier computation and so on. Those are kind of typical tricks. There is probability function to use in MATLAB. So there are kind of ideas. Like I said, we can share the, the, the slide so you can look at it later on. Um, what to do when this inverse of covariance matrix is uh, also kind of hanging in because of a lot of computation? Well, you can just use the pooled covariance matrix. Let's also just take it as a computation tip. Uh, there are papers uh, dealing with this, and that's kind of known trick in templates. And, and finally, um, can we use multiple traces? That's the question. So yeah, that's not always the case, uh, but sometimes you really indeed get to, 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 use, uh, um, to use same key several instances, and that's typically sometimes uh, can be much uh, more uh, exploitable in practice. So it can work much, much better than when you have just one trace. And there are also some ideas how to then improve computation with that respect. Okay. Um, this is the end of my part. I see I've, yeah, I, I started a bit later, but nevertheless, I took maybe seven, eight minutes extra. So sorry for that. Um, if there are questions, I'm around. So please, you also feel free to use Discord to ask questions. And um, I'm handing over to Shiva. Uh, thanks, Ella, for this talk. There are two questions in the chat right now, but I'll just read them out. So mm -hmm. uh, in communication systems, we typically use much more advanced decoders like Sphere and uh, reduce ML to to decrease lattice spaces of symbol. Um, I'm not sure to follow the question very much, uh, but uh, like, like, like uh, I think like it refers to if the reduction is, is similar uh, 
to, to what you're using in the template as well? Um, let me see if I, if I, uh, where is the question? Is that the last one or one but last? Uh, one ah, yes, like sphere and reduced. Hmm. I, I don't really know the answer. Um, yeah, I, I think yes, but I, I'm, I'm not familiar with, with actually what you mean with this uh, lattice spaces. Uh, maybe second okay, sure. question as well. Uh, sorry, yeah. Uh, uh, Aditya, yeah, maybe we can take it offline. So yeah, either in Discord or you can send me mail. Uh, maybe it's just now too too short for me also to think a bit about it. Uh, there's another question which uh, which asks: uh, Is your method based on Gaussian uh, process regression or uh, Gaussian hypothesis testing? It's basically hypothesis testing. So with re with regression, we have more this uh, stochastic models that's using linear regression and taking into account that not all bits contribute in the same way. So there is you using re regression, a model is used to, um, to to say to profile in the same way as we do with templates. So if you look at the paper called stochastic models, I guess that will explain that. I also have a question actually on, uh, on templates. So uh, normally uh, it is recommended that we, when we build templates, uh, we should use random keys rather than a fixed key. So, yeah. so what, 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 what is the reason uh, behind that? you mean um to build templates to, to build templates like while, while profiling it should be more the random keys yeah rather than a I, I would say just to, to to make sure like as in, in in the same way as as when we generate plain text you you you, you want to to have as 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 random as possible to kind of prevent any bias with certain keys or you know just to um to kind of eliminate any statistics favoring uh, certain uh, choices and and uh, uh, computations and so on yeah thank you uh, i think yeah maybe so i see uh, no further questions so right now uh, it's uh, well here it's 4 420 so uh, for 418 maybe we can come back for stephen's talk at 430 Mm -hmm. uh, Maybe 12 minutes break. then, yeah. Sounds good. Okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah, of course. See you in 12 minutes. So and thanks, uh, everyone. And uh, yeah, uh, enjoy the rest of tutorial and the conference. Thank you. And much. feel free to contact me if you have any, any other questions or uh, if you want any other directions for the things that I was only able to briefly mention and not really speak about much. So just, yeah, you know, feel free to, to reach out. I will, I'll be happy to, to help. So we will be back here in, in exactly 11 minutes from now. So uh, please, uh, like, uh, be, be on time so we, we can start at uh, exactly at 30. Thank you.
Stephen, shall we start? Sure, sure, I'm ready. So welcome back everyone. Uh, so, so far in the tutorial, we had a very nice talk from Professor Bettina on uh, template attacks. And now this will be followed by uh, a talk from uh, uh, Professor Stephen Pichet uh, on machine, also deep learning or SCA for sidechain attacks. So to introduce uh, uh, Stephen, uh, so Stephen Pichet is an assistant professor in the cybersecurity group at U Delft Netherlands. His research interest um, uh, include security cryptography, machine learning, and evolutionary comp computation. Uh, before uh, his professor position, uh, Stephen was a postdoctoral researcher at MIT USA and at KU Leuven, Belgium. Uh, Stephen finished his PhD in 2015 uh, with a topic on cryptology and evolutionary uh, computation techniques. Uh, he has several years of experience working in industry and for the government, and is also a member of the organization Committee for International Summer School in Cryptography and the President of Croatian IEEE CIS chapter. He's a general co-chair of Eurocrypt 2020 and 21, uh, and also program committee member and reviewer for several esteemed conferences and journals uh, in the domain of security and machine learning. So it, it's a pleasure to introduce Stefan also, especially because uh, in one way or the other, he also influenced me to to start on this topic of deep learning. So Stephen, please, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the nice introduction. So hello everyone, uh, my name is Stepan, and I will give you the second part of the tutorial that I called machine deep learning and side channel analysis. So let's start immediately. First of all, let me tell you uh, that the, uh, what I will be talking here today is based on joint work with, with many, many people. And here I mentioned Leila Batina, Guilherme Perin, Anneli Heiser, Li Chavu, uh, Lukas, um, uh, Shivam, uh, and so many other people. Um, for many things I will be discussing today, basically it's something that we did together um, in, in my group called IC Lab. And here you can also see the link because we also have our uh, GitHub page where you can find uh, source code for, for many of the projects I will be talking about. So let's, let's just uh, briefly recap the situation on profiled while uh, Leila introduced it, but just to emphasize this. So these are the profiled attacks. So we have two devices, one identical copy where we learn in template lingo, we build template in machine learning Lingo, we build a machine learning model, and then we have another device called device under attack, and we use the knowledge that we obtained from the first device to hopefully successfully attack the second device. And this is this is the setup we will stay to, uh, today for the lecture. So, again, a little bit connecting with the previous part of the lecture, uh, what happened with profile attacks, let's say, ten years ago let's say almost 20 years ago, there was template attack and Leila talked about it. And then somewhere 10 years ago, it's not so easy to say, people started using machine learning, especially supervised learning, uh, because they recognized what we call in supervised learning training and testing. Basically it's very similar or can be even the same as what we call in side channel and profile side channel analysis, um, profiling and attacking. But what's very important also to say, when people started using machine learning for side channel attacks. That machine learning was not used only for the attacks. So of course, people used various machine learning techniques, support vector machines, random forest, uh, naive bias, multi-layer perception, various techniques to break a target. But also they used techniques like that for pre-processing, feature engineering. So what Leila was saying, how to select points of interest, and of course, there are many techniques from the machine learning domain that can help you select points of interest or when you're talking machine learning ter terms, select features. So that's important to realize, let's say 10 years ago, we, we were using machine learning for many, many things in side channel analysis. And then let's say somewhere four years ago, it's not trivial to say uh, because um, I noticed when reading all the papers, people were a little bit less keen on details. So they did not really uh, precisely always describe what kind of machine learning they used. So how deep was the neural network? 
So it was, it's sometimes very difficult to say, is it deep learning or is it shallow learning? That's why I say four years ago, because four years ago, at, I think at Space 2016, um, Maghrebi et al. presented a paper where they used convolutional neural networks to do side channel attack. And uh, that was definitely a strong start for, for deep learning in side channel analysis. Now, why do we like deep learning for side channel analysis? Well, first reason is it allows us to reach top performance even if device is protected with countermeasures. Second part that we really like is that, well, often we do not need to pre-process the data. Again, remember what Leila was saying, template attack, how do you select features? If you have too many features, complexity of template attack is too high, then you can get instability of covariance matrices and so on and so on. But with deep learning, we kind of go for the lazy approach where we say, well, here you go, neural network, I feed the raw features, and I hope my neural network will solve what features are important. It will take those features, it will do something with those features, and less important, non-important features will be discarded. So those are, let's say, two main reasons why deep learning today in side channel analysis is so well represented, but also powerful. Top results, easy pre-processing or no pre-processing. So when we talk about neural networks, about deep learning uh, in, in side channel analysis, it's a, it's a very important question to, to answer, okay, but what kind of deep learning are we talking about? Because deep learning is a huge domain. So there are many types of uh, deep learning. Commonly in side channel analysis, when we talk about deep learning, we talk either about multi-layer perceptrons or convolutional neural networks. Multi-layer perceptrons are much simpler. Basically, it's just layer after layer of dense, densely connected neurons. Convolutional neural networks are a little bit more complicated. They have different types of layers, so they can have convolution layers. Basically, convolution layers will be selecting the most important features. Then you have pooling layers, those would be working to downsample, so to go only for the most important things. And then you, again, you have the fully connected layers, like in the multi-layer perceptron, that actually do the classification process. Because remember, when we said today we will talk only about supervised machine learning, so the, our task in supervised machine learning is classification. What does it mean? Well, we have examples. We have labels for those examples. We built a model based on that we try to guess the labels for new, previously unseen examples. And here I give one depiction of, let's say, common, although it's not so easy to say what is a common convolutional neural network in side channel, but you can see the most important parts. First, we have the input, so our raw measurements, something we obtain from the oscilloscope. Then we have our convolution layers, max pooling layers, maybe with some other tricks like batch normalizations and so on and so on. So we repeat a couple of layers where we start, let's say, bigger in one dimension. So the, um, the number of filters will be maybe increasing by the power of, uh, by the power of two in every, in every um, convolution and so on and so on, until we reach in the end something like dropout or we flatten. And then finally we have here somewhere would be fully connected layers. And this depiction would basically gives us the probabilities that a trace has belongs to a certain key. So that a certain trace has a certain key as the correct one. So this is something I would call common, but it's far from saying this is the only thing. Let's, let's just take a look how far are we or how close are we to other types of neural networks that are commonly used in deep learning, in machine learning, let's say, but in other domains. So here you can see three uh, very famous neural networks, AlexNet, VGG, and ResNet. So those are deep learning networks that each on its own made deep learning what it is today. AlexNet as one of the first ones, VGG as one appearing a couple of years ago, but obtaining various top performance results and ResNet something appearing, well, now also a couple of years ago, but being, let's say, very deep. 
So AlexNet has eight layers. ResNet has 152 layers. Where are we with side channel? Well, the network I showed you on previous page is somewhere a little bit smaller than AlexNet. And amazingly, but currently what uh, the top neural networks that we use in profile side channel analysis are actually much smaller than AlexNet. So it's, I, I do believe this is very interesting perspective. In side channel community, we like to talk about deep learning. We like to talk, well, we use deep learning here. We use deep learning there. Because also what we had discussion a couple of days ago at the um, Asian host, if you say I'm using deep learning, it also kind of helps you sell your paper better. But realistically, what we use as deep learning is far from deep learning that people use in other domains. So our networks are much smaller, our data sets are much smaller, our numbers of features are commonly smaller. So it's a very interesting situation. One would say amazing, but it seems the side channel problems are obviously much simpler than many other problems in other domains, simply because apparently we need very small neural networks. If that's enough, well, what's the problem? Well, there is one big difference between basically side channel and almost any other domain. In other domains, when there is a noise, a noise is basically a consequence of, of a setup. But usually when you will be doing classification in other domains, there will be small amounts of noise. In side channel, if you wanna be realistic, there will be always noise and often there will be a lot of noise. Why? Because many types of countermeasures you can actually interpret as noise. So environmental noise like ocean noise, but also things that you have because of the uh, misalignment. So countermeasures like desynchronization, like random delay interrupts, like jitter, countermeasures on the other hand, like shuffling or masking, all those make the side channel task much more difficult. And this is one of the important differences that I hope you will remember. So this is what makes makes it still challenging for us to use machine learning, to use deep learning, and to successfully break targets. Now, again, when we talk about different types of neural networks, like I said, in, in my talk today, I will be concentrating either on multi-layer perceptrons or convolutional neural networks. One would say, okay, but that's only two types of neural networks, so what's the problem? You have a couple of minutes of work, use one, use other, you are done. Well, there are many differences. Of course, you can define your neural network to be looking in various, various ways. So for instance, here, I give example of a multi-layer perceptron with what I call here, many hidden layers. It's actually not so many, but it did not fit the page with more layers to be still readable. But I can also have this kind of architecture, one hidden layer, but many more neurons in that layer. See, here I have like 10 neurons. Let's say here I have maybe hundreds of neurons in my hidden layer. And now the question is, which network is better? Which neural network is better? And actually, this is impossible basically to, to answer without running our side channel experiment, without really trying to break the key and seeing the result. So this is also telling you, well, Indeed, maybe we do not use many types of neural networks, many types of deep learning in our side channel. And maybe our neural networks are much smaller than in other domains. But still, there are so many choices one can take. Some of the choices will work great. Some of the choices will work just fine. Some of the choices will be very bad. And those you would definitely want to stay away from. And this is also one uh, thing that I actually added this morning because I think could be interesting. So I did a search on ePrint looking for uh, mentioning of machine learning or deep learning in papers, in titles of the papers. So what, what we can see, machine learning for sure appeared before, already people 2008 were using the term machine learning, but the number of papers were actually very small and now even 2020, something like that. Let's say we have 20 papers a year. What happens with the deep learning? Well, 
indeed, first time we mentioned it, it's around 2016. And then we see very nice growth in numbers of papers. This is actually also telling you how relevant, but also how interesting is this topic for, for many researchers. And now I know one would say, ah, 25 papers, it's not a lot. And I agree, if you compare, I did search for deep learning on archive and I got 34,980 papers. Of course, 25 papers or let's sum it, 50 papers is nothing, but this is very specialized niche and domain that we also started much later than other people started in general for deep learning. So this tells us that indeed deep learning is very interesting today for many researchers in, in let's say security domain. Now, when we talk about our attacks, our uh, machine learning, our deep learning attacks on, on side channel, I think it's also very important to understand what kind of attacks are we actually talking about in terms of data sets. And unfortunately, this is also one of the big issues we have as the community today. There is only a number, a small number of publicly available data sets. And of course, you want to use publicly available data sets. Otherwise, your results are not really reproducible. So data sets that we commonly use are something like DPA contest before, ASHD, random delay, ASCA data sets. And what we can see here is, well, for instance, first DPA contest before is very, uh, very easy data set to break. So think of it if the spikes tells us the most important features, and if we have something like this, only a couple of peaks, that means our, our machine learning can concentrate only on those points and relatively easily break the target. But then ASHD is a lot of noise, random delay, there is a lot of noise because also there is random delay countermeasure, ASCAD, some noise, but also masking countermeasure. Very important to say is here that unfortunately, all these data sets are, let's say, relatively easy to break. So this is also giving us, uh, putting us into position that we are devising new techniques, more powerful techniques all the time, but the data sets are not really um, beneficial for that kind of analysis because they are, let's say, easy enough that even different techniques do not show significantly sometimes different behavior because if something is easy to break, you can use something extremely simple, you can use something extremely complicated, but it's still easy to break. So this is also one thing that we as the community need to do much better. We need to provide more data sets, more realistic data sets that anyone can use. So when we, uh, just also to mention this, when we talk about during the paper about performance, we will be, uh, uh, interested, of course, in the attack performance. So basically, how many traces, how many measurements do we need to obtain the key? And common metrics are something like key rank, success rate, guessing entropy. I will mostly be talking about key rank, basically a position in your guessing vector where is the correct key. So for instance, if your neural network says key is 55, and this is indeed the correct key, then your guessing entropy would be, let's say, one. If your neural network says correct key is 55, but actually 55 is not correct key, then your guessing entropy will be more than one, depending on what position is the correct key. Uh, and guessing entropy, so, sorry, this was key rank. And guessing entropy is just the averaged key rank because commonly you want to repeat your experiments many times so that you know that you were not either lucky or unlucky with the selection of measurements you are taking. The, these, these are the measures I will be using, key rank, guessing entropy. So let me just show you a couple of results that are not even new results. So these results are now more than one and a half years old. So for something like uh, DPA before data set, on the x-axis we have the number of traces, on the y-axis we have the guessing entropy, and actually you can see with some simple tricks we can, let's say, easily break this data set in, in five measurements. And this is very, very close to the best possible attack of, of one measurement to break. And immediately I'm telling you, since this is, like I said, old, 
there are now much, much better attacks that can break DPAV4 in one or two traces. But even if we go for something, let's say, that we would intuitively think it's, it's more difficult because it has countermeasure like ASRD, that that data set has random delay countermeasure as introduced at the CHESS 2009 paper, we can see that we can easily break it. And not easily break it, but crazy easily break it. We can see here that we need only two measurements to break a data set protected with a countermeasure. So why is that? Well, this is one of the benefits of deep learning, especially here benefit of convolutional neural network. Why? Because convolutional neural networks have the property of spatial invariance, which basically means your random delay interrupt countermeasure will have little to no effect on, on the performance. Misalignment will not do a lot. So we can see that deep learning actually has inherent ways sometimes to fight some of the countermeasures we are using. And then here you have also the ASCA data set. Again, relatively simple to break. And I can tell you today, our results are already around 100 measurements to, to break the target. So here it was a little bit more than 500. One and a half years later, below 100. So actually we do see our, our state of the art, our results are improving significantly. Now, one can still ask the question, fine, those data sets are there. Neural networks are apparently breaking it successfully. But can we do something still different? Can we do something, let's say, from one side, more traditional, think also about pre-processing, and from other side, still consider things from the deep learning perspective, let's say, from the, from the very state-of-the-art perspective. And recently, we, we were playing with this, and we said, basically, well, you can think that various side channel countermeasures that we have actually can be considered as noise. Gaussian noise because you have some random number generator or because of the um, not so great environment or various kinds of hiding countermeasures like random delay interrupt, desynchronization, jitter. Can we consider this as a noise? If the answer would be yes, we can ask a next question. Okay, if that's noise, do we know techniques from deep learning that can remove noise. And actually, we do know techniques like that. One technique is called denoising autoencoder. What is autoencoder? Well, it's a machine learning technique. It's a neural network consisting of two parts, encoder and decoder. What does the encoder do? It transfers the input to a latent space. Basically, you can think it takes many features and then compress them into a small number of most important features. What does the decoder do? It goes other side. It goes from the, those most important features, again, let's say, to the original input size representation. How do we do it with denoising autoencoder? Very simple. On one side of our uh, the autoencoder, we put noisy measurements. On the other side of our autoencoder, we put clean measurements, so without countermeasure. And then we ask neural network, okay, find me a way to go from one data set to another data set. Basically, find me a way to remove the noise, to remove the countermeasure. And now one can ask, can this work? And actually, it can work. So here uh, I show some results when we use desynchronization. So desynchronization is like global misalignment. And more important uh, figure is figure on the right side where I show guessing entropy results. What happens when we do some kind of averaging of the traces or what happens with convolutional neural network if I just use noisy measurements or measurements with desynchronization, we can see the attack doesn't really work. Guessing entropy 45, 50, 55 actually is not successful break. But then if we use denoising out encoder to remove desynchronization, we can see that the attack suddenly becomes very successful. We need around 2000, a little bit more measurements for guessing entropy zero or one, however we wanna look at it. So the best guess is the correct guess. And what's also very important to notice, we can even go for much simpler technique like multi-layer Pesetron but because of the nice pre-processing, 
we can still have very good attack performance. And this can be even extended. We can use even, let's say, simpler techniques. We can first denoise and then use template attack, for instance. Various combinations can work. And then similar behavior here I show also for different type of countermeasure, random delay interrupt. It's more difficult than desynchronization because RDI is a local misalignment, but still we break it successfully, or jitter, called jitter. So again, local misalignment, still we see that we can break it successfully after denoising with multi-layer passenger. So this, this tells us that while, uh, while we are commonly using today our deep learning for attack only, there is actually no reason to do that. We can, let's say, go back a little bit in past and think what we were doing before when we were using machine learning techniques for pre-processing for feature selection. We can still do that today to ease the job for our deep learning. While, because while deep learning is powerful, that doesn't mean it's a silver bullet that can solve all our problems. So why wouldn't we make our problems simpler before using deep learning? The next thing what I wanna talk is a little bit connecting, let's say, theory and uh, deep learning results. So when we, are, when we are doing deep learning attacks or machine learning attacks in general, uh, of course, unfortunately, uh, we will use machine learning metrics to drive the training process. But in the end, we are interested in side channel metric to evaluate the attack. So this is, for instance, difference when we talk about accuracy as a machine learning metric versus guessing entropy as a side channel metric. And of course, ideally, when we are doing our deep learning attack, we want to train our neural network exactly the, the number of epochs, so the, uh, the, the length of time that is required. What does it mean that is required? So exactly the time we need for our neural network to generalize well, what does it mean generalizing? Well, it means it will generalize to unseen examples, but we don't want to go into overfitting. What is overfitting? It's a phenomenon where your neural network learn so well the examples with labels that it does not know how to generalize to the examples without labels. So basically it learned the, the specific examples you gave, but it did not really learn how to do the classification process. So the question is, how do we see all these effects? What does it mean for side channel analysis? And then we can also say that in, in side channel, this generalization phase, so the phase that we want to be in, directly relates to the key recovery. What does it mean to the key recovery? So it, it relates to the moment when we can successfully uh, recover the key. And very interestingly, Basically, all the results, almost all the results we have up to now, tells us that generalization commonly happens very early in side channel. You know, in other domains, it's not unheard of that you are training something for thousands of epochs. In side channel, we are often talking, well, we trained it for 10, 20, 50 epochs, or if we are very, very uh, generous, 100 epochs. So, relatively short training time, and we are still able to get good results. But what does it even mean good results? If we would be looking at it from the machine learning perspective, actually often our results are very bad. So when we talk in machine learning terms, if you say something works worse than random guessing, that's very bad. That basically means you did nothing. In, in side channel with deep learning, often you can easily have your accuracy is below random guessing, and still you have good enough generalization phase, meaning you can still recover the key. So why, why is this? Let me show you a couple of examples. So this is Pinata AES implementation, so software implementation, basically something very easy to break. Left picture shows you the training accuracy, validation accuracy, and test accuracy. So what can we see? Training accuracy goes the more epochs all the time up. But interestingly, validation improves very shortly up to let's say 10 epochs. And then 
it kind of starts slowly degrading. Why? Because after this point, we do not really learn how to generalize. We learn just the examples in the training set. And this is also what we see with the test accuracy. But let's see what happens here. Why is this attack so successful? If we look at the class probability ranks. So this would be basically the probabilities obtained from our neural network. What are those probabilities? The numbers telling how likely that the correct answer is zero. So the correct key would be zero, that the correct key would be one, two, three, four, five, all the way to 255. So we are interested in those probabilities. And what we can see here is that those class probability ranks that actually are the correct ones have very high values. That means most of our guesses are correct. But if our best guesses are not correct, then commonly our second best guesses are correct, or third best guesses, or fourth best guesses. But this can actually see with the pink line that we don't need more than five. After that, we are never needing those guesses. What happens with all the wrong key hypotheses? Well, you can see that wrong key hypothesis, the slope is much less steep. And that many of those wrong key hypotheses actually have less than half of the probability of the correct hypothesis. Okay, so one can say, why is this important? Well, simple reason. It means what we classify, what we guess is either best guess or second best guess or third best guess. But as we in the guessing entropy, we sum all the probabilities, those most likely guesses start to be more and more likely. And that's why everything works. What happens for more difficult target? So ASCA. You can again see on the left figure, accuracy going up like crazy, amazing. So more than 90%, one would say amazing performance. But what do we see for, from validation, from the test accuracy? Well, very soon it levels up and basically does not go up more than 25, 26, 27%. And actually we see the more we train, the performance actually starts to degrade because we overfit it. What happens with the output class probabilities? Now the pink line, the correct key hypothesis is still kind of the best, the highest for the first class probability rank, but there are many wrong key guesses that are very close. And then the second best guess, well, already we have higher probabilities for the second best guesses that are wrong than they are correct. And this is basically answering why our machine learning attack can work even if it's below random guessing, but it still breaks because maybe your best guess is wrong, but your second best guess is correct. And maybe your third best guess is correct. So if we look only at the first best guesses, our performance is not great. But as we start to sum the probabilities, our uh, performance starts to improve. And that's why we see the more we have, the more information we have, the more we can improve the attack performance. But then, so now we can ask, fine, this is very nice. We see probabilities. We, of course, want to have the pink line to be very separated from, from the uh, gray lines, but how to reach that? Well, this is what our community is commonly doing. So we are looking for the more powerful techniques, more powerful neural networks. We are looking for better hyperparameters. We are looking into regularization techniques. But here I just want to tell you, we can do also something that's much simpler. So what, what can we do? Well, obviously, when you are doing your, your, let's say, machine learning experiments, there is a lot of experiments you want to do before you select your best experiment. And what do we then do with all the other experiments? Well, we just discard them. We say, well, this is the best one. All the others are not as good, so let's just discard them. But why don't we just combine all those results? And then what we can do, we can use something like bagging. It's a very simple um, ensemble technique where we train many classifiers 
and then many machine learning algorithms. And then we calculate the average prediction from each classifier, and then we combine. So here we can see a couple of results. Again, ask a data set. What happens if we use just one best model, green line? What happens if we use combination of many models? So we can see here that we managed to break ASCAD, something that I showed you a couple of slides ago, more than 500 traces, now with a little bit more than 50 traces. And even with a simpler machine learning technique like multi-layer perceptron, similar results go also for convolutional neural network. So the, the point of this story is there are many things that people in other communities use to improve the performance. And we do not need all the time to reinvent the wheel. We should look what other people are doing. We should recognize what techniques can be also useful in side channel analysis. And we should use those techniques to improve the results. And here is for, for a different leakage model, for the identity leakage model, again, for ASCAD, you can see here that we managed to break the target uh, basically with 10, 15 measurements at most if we use something as simple as ensemble. So if I take many machine learning models and I just combine the results. Do we have any questions that I should maybe take? We have on? One, uh, one question, uh, which uh, basically asks that normally the quality of your training data will define uh, how well your model is, right? So yeah. uh, is there some way to, uh, to have a good sampling method so that you can construct a good training data set from a noisy training data set? Mm -hmm. Very, very good question. So good, uh, good data set uh, from, from the noisy data set. Well, uh, yes, no, maybe. Uh, first of all, yes, we can, we can do various techniques, like we can do regularization at the input, which would uh, force the network to generalize better. We can use something like data augmentation where we would add more measurements to improve our performance. We can use something like denoising out encoder to remove the noise. So there are techniques that we can use. What, is, what can be very dangerous is this. If you remove too much of your noise, then how well do you, would that data set with your machine learning model map to a new data set to the device under attack? Because if your device under attack st still has all that noise and now you cannot remove it, then your model that you train maybe will not work the best. So then you would have the performance that the training accuracy would go crazy up, maybe up even to 100%, but your testing accuracy would be almost flat line, nothing. So yes, there are various techniques where we can do stuff, but what is important is to realize how, how in any way that we prepare the training set, set we should also prepare the testing set, the attack set to, to follow the, the first assumption in machine learning that is IID distribution. Okay, so after I told you how well machine learning, deep learning works, I showed you results where it's, let's say, relatively amazing. Uh, let, let me now change the story completely. And I will tell you now that all that I showed you is basically very exaggerated, almost, almost wrong. Why? Because what we do in side channel community is that while there are two devices in reality, actually we commonly use only one device and then we artificially divide the measurements and we say, well, these measurements represent the first device, these measurements represent the second device. And of course, that will be a much simpler problem because everything comes from one device, reality, two devices. Ad additionally, what we also do is, since we use everything from a one device, there is only a single key for everything. So your training set has the same key as the testing set. That will not happen in reality. So the question is, what does it happen in reality? How much more difficult the attack is? And here, I just wanna show you a couple of the results. So this would be the setting I talked up to now. 
And this is very, very easy target to break. No countermeasures, no nothing. So when we have the same key and device, we artificially divide the measurements into training and testing, and we attack. What we can see is, well, the attacks are very simple. Two, three measurements, we break the target. So now let's ask the question, what happens if we have different key, but still same device? Well, immediately we see the attacks become a little bit more difficult. What happens if we have the same key, but now different devices? Well, we see the attacks become even more difficult. And then finally, what happens if we have different key, different device? Well, we can see some results are still very good, like these lines here, but some results are completely wrong. Why? Because we learn the behavior for one device and that behavior is different enough that it does not know how to go to the different device. So this is just a cautionary story that our attacks that we have in academia can look a little bit more or even more, much more powerful than they actually are in reality. But for us in academia, this is still fine. And also it's fine for security labs because if you consider that you have the same device, same key, that is the worst case scenario for the, for the defender, for the security evaluator, for, for the designer, if you want, because the attacker is as, as powerful as possible. He got amazing data set, only one key. If the attacker cannot break that, then going to reality, of course, he will not be able to break that. That's why we are still using same device uh, and well, either same key or even different keys in academia, but just be careful. In reality, it can be more difficult than that. And here, the results I gave you up to now are, are for block ciphers or even more precisely for AES. And what we know is that supervised machine learning is very powerful when considering AES. But what happens if we go for public key crypto? Well, we have also results there. Supervised machine learning is also very powerful when attacking unprotected RSA or ECC. There is also a paper last year space where we managed to, uh, to break one uh, public key uh, imp implementation with deep learning with only a single measurement, so the best possible attack. But we also know that supervised machine learning is very powerful when attacking a protected implementation. But let's now switch completely and we ask the question, okay, but what can we do with unsupervised machine learning if we do public key crypto that is also protected with state-of-the-art countermeasures? So just as a quick explanation, in unsupervised, we do not have the setup where we know the labels for any examples. We don't know the labels. And of course, our modern uh, public key crypto implementations are protected like uh, uh, different countermeasures based on randomization of the private or ephemeral key. So there is a scalar blinding. And of course, there is the constant time implementations and so on. So, on. so because of all these problems, uh, what we commonly have in real world scenario is that we can attack only on a single trace. And then to do that kind of attack, people commonly use horizontal attacks. And horizontal attacks are very powerful, single trace attacks that, that can break ECC or RSA implementations that are protected. But of course, for that attack to be successful, you need to guess a lot of bits correctly. And if you do not guess, uh, guess enough bits correctly, you will be left with sufficient number of wrong bits and you do not know where you get wrong bits that your attack basically becomes impossible to brute force. Why? Because think of, of a setting where your key has only 100 bits. And I tell you, well, your attack is 90% accurate. So 90 out of 100 bits, you correctly guessed. But I don't tell you on what positions. So you still don't, you know 10 are wrong, but you don't know which 10 are wrong. So the effort to do that is significant. And if you go for practical setting like RSA 2048, the effort with 90% becomes huge. So 
this is what we wanted to explore. How can we use deep learning to improve our horizontal attacks? And we considered uh, Microsoft libraries, so Curve 2559, 120-bit security level. So there are two elliptic curve scalar multiplication implementations based on Montgomery ladder. Basically, the difference is how you implement conditional swap, either arithmetic means or pointer swapping. And then on the countermeasure side, it's regular, it's constant time, but while this library does not have randomization, we collect the traces with random scalar, which basically means it's like randomized scalar. And then we wanna ask the question, if the attack with horizontal attack, which is how we commonly do it, but our horizontal attack is not very good, can we use deep learning to make it better? And how do we do it? Well, first of all, we just do our horizontal attack. I don't have enough time to go into full explanation of horizontal attack, but just think of it, you take one trace, cut it in many small uh, sub traces, basically for bits zero and one. And then you just try to say, well, this bit is zero, this bit is one. And now let us assume that our horizontal attack works only a little bit better than random guess. So only slightly better than 50%. And here for our attack, we had a scenario where our horizontal attack worked with accuracy of 52.44%. Basically means from 100 bits, we guess correctly 52 or 53 bits, depending how lucky we are. What do we do? Well, we use deep learning. Why? Because deep learning is also known to be able to, to deal with noise well. So what do we do? We take our data set, we divide it into two parts. We train on one part, we predict the other part, and we relabel the other part based on what our neural network said. What do we do next? We train on that other part, we predict the first part, and we relabel the first part. Then we combine those parts and we shuffle it and we repeat. That's why we call this setup iterative framework. And this training, this prediction is based on deep learning or convolution neural network. And how many times do we need to repeat this? Well, depends. The more noise you have, the less successful horizontal attack, probably you will need to repeat it longer. But what kind of results can we get? So here, let's start with the figure all the way to the right and just look at the average line. So if we do a simple machine learning, we can use a lot of framework iterations, so these times we repeat the process, but we are still staying just barely above 50%. But then we can do data augmentation. So we take the measurements, we rotate them, we shift them, and we consider those as new measurements. And already we can see that our accuracy goes to 60%. Then we can add also dropout, more than 70%. Then we can add also uh, dropout and data augmentation on average more than 80%, on best case scenario 100%. Second data set even simpler. So we can see that actually, while deep learning does work amazingly for supervised machine learning, there are ways how to use deep learning also for pre processing, but also, uh, but also for removing the noise in, let's say, different kind of way to improve the results significantly. So to conclude, let me just tell you some of the challenges and some of the directions that I notice people are doing. So what are the challenges? How to select our machine learning techniques, how to do hyperparameter tuning. Very, very simple question when you look at it naively, but there are so many options that you can do experiments for years and you would not finish. Portability, so this, this difference of data sets. Then the lack of data sets. Then very important topic of interpretability and explainability. Fine, our neural network did something, but can we really understand what did it do? Then that problem of no clear connections between machine learning and side channel metrics. Then the countermeasures. Then also the perspective that we are solving problems that we often already know how to solve. Then challenges how to make good methodologies, 
then how to go into unsupervised learning setup for, for instance, for block cycles. What are some directions that people are currently looking at? Well, we are looking how to make custom layers, custom loss functions, so to make attacks better, how to get smaller neural networks, how to use different techniques for the hyperparameter optimization like Bayesian optimization, how to improve guessing entropy, because guessing entropy also sometimes can be a deceptive metric. It, it can tell us something that actually is not necessarily true. Then we are thinking how to develop new metrics for to tell us that deep learning is really working well. Then we use deep learning for leakage assessment, development of methodologies, and so on and so on. To conclude, in implementation attacks, in side channel attacks, machine learning represents today the most powerful option. And what's very important, state of the art in side channel analysis is much simpler usually than state of the art in other domains when we talk about deep learning. There are some specific parts what one does not encounter in other domains, but some of the knowledge is transferable. So very, a very important message, do not try to reinvent the wheel. Many, uh, many problems we face in side channel analysis, other domains face instead of thinking of your new way how to fight it, consider what the community in machine learning did in the last 30 years. Maybe there are already solutions. And very important message for the end, I would say, we are all the time using machine learning, deep learning to attack, and this is great. But we are still also neglecting very important questions. Why do we do attacks? Well, we do attacks to be able to understand the security better, and in the end, to be able to provide more secure products. But if we just use deep learning to break, break, break without thinking what is really happening, we actually do not learn anything how to improve the security of devices. So this is, this is one huge challenge we will need to face in future to understand why our neural networks are so powerful and to understand what do we need to do to make our implementations more secure against deep learning based attacks. With that, thank you for your attention. And if you have questions, I will be happy to answer. Thanks, Stephen, uh, for this lovely talk. I'm checking the chat now. If there are no further questions. Uh, uh, so I would encourage uh, everyone to please uh, come forward and uh, type in your questions. In the meantime, I actually have a very, uh, let's say, a general question on how, how to use these techniques. So let's say if you're working as an evaluator where you're, you're dealing with a variety of products, like sometimes you're working in white box setting, gray box setting, mm -hmm. uh, as well as you have uh, unprotected implementation, protected implementation, even protected implementation where for profiling, you could turn on or turn off a countermeasure. So, I mean, um, like, can you talk about like some kind of a general guideline of uh, when to use a classical template attack, uh, which uh, from a information theory point of view is the strongest or use deep learning, like, especially when you're dealing with different kind of implementation on a day-to-day -day basis? Mm -hmm. Well, Naive answer would be, I, I do recommend always start with simpler techniques because I, I'm honestly against those overkills. Template attack has a very nice advantage. It does not have any uh, hyperparameters to tune. As such, you run your template attack, fine, you do some kind of feature selection, but that's, let's say, relatively simple procedure and you see your performance. If your attack works well, well, then if you want to sell a paper, maybe you need to go for a deep learning, but from practical perspective, no need. If your template is actually not working well, then you start. You need to start thinking what kind of techniques do you want to use? And then of course, there are many, many ways how to, how to go. So like I said, many people are now uh, considering as small as possible neural networks. And I see advantages of that. Smaller neural network, faster training, hopefully easier to explain. But I do also believe that smaller neural networks are much more difficult to generalize to little bit different data sets, to little bit different setups. So um, 
it will depend on, on the on the exact scenario you are in. If you are doing something where you have a target, you want to break that target and then you are done, maybe you will go with, you will start with some simple multi-layer perceptron. You will uh, observe the, the performance and then you will say, well, based on the performance, I see I need to have more neurons. I, I need to have less neurons and then you will do something like that. But maybe you will go for something like more general approach and you will design a bigger neural network. And then you would use something like transfer learning to just adapt to different data sets. So I would say it depends. In general, I would recommend a little bit bigger neural networks than, uh, than we use currently, honestly. And then considering those more, um, more advanced concepts from machine learning community like um, Bayesian optimization for tuning, uh, transfer learning for going from one data set to another, and so on, so on. Um, there are two more questions. Uh, sure. uh, are you able to see? Uh, uh, so the first question is, uh, if the target function to be approximated by neural network is uh, Lipschitz uh, continuous function, including step function, MLP works well uh, and is enough. Is SCA uh, target function can be approximate in this case? Uh, well, good question. Thank you. So uh, Lipschitz uh, is basically a class of functions that is, uh, that is at every point you can say, well, this is the, the largest step it has. So basically it gives you some continuity on all the domain. Basically, uh, what I would say is, yes, if, if we have Lipschitz continuous function, uh, MLP does work well. And for sure, in that kind of setups, SCA would work amazingly. Uh, the problem when we already have in general is that all our profiling models, so sorry, leakage models are approximations. So nothing is really the perfect thing we do in reality. So I would say SCA target functions are definitely in somewhere in this in this class, uh, but that doesn't mean it's always very good case. So you have different cases, you have different scenarios, and one could also think of, there is in general, no reason why you wouldn't also try gradient uh, uh, techniques with neural networks that are not based on the gradient method. So that you, where you don't expect to have derivatives, that could also work. That in that case, you would not even need a Lipschitz continuous function. But currently, as to the best of my knowledge, we are all considering it somehow to be in the continuous function and it working well. So, um, um, so I would say, uh, is SCA target function to be approximated in this function class? Naively, I would say yes, because we are kind of doing that without even thinking a lot about it, and it seems it works, we break. But I don't know that anyone ever really did, let's say, more theoretical analysis trying to, to, to uh, think about SCA target functions from, from, uh, from these general space perspectives. I see more questions. We have another oh. question from Mileha Buhan. Uh, so she asked, in your opinion, how close are we, and by we, she means uh, SCA community, in finding the suitable training metric for deep learning? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, uh, hi, Lana. a uh, very good question. I must be honest, I don't know. So from my personal experience, a couple of months ago, I was thinking we are very close. But then what we did actually did not, did not work well. So I, I was thinking, okay, then we are not close. But I think there is also a bigger question. Indeed, um, there is a discrepancy between side channel metrics and, and machine learning metrics. We cannot argue, I mean, that's clear. But of course, at the same time, we do see our side channel works good, even with these far from optimal techniques, far from optimal metrics. So I would say um, we could be based on, on this observation that it works fine. I would say we could be relatively close because one would say we do not need to do extremely radical changes to make it 
to make it more appropriate for, for side channel. But at the other side, I would say they are relatively far because I don't see huge, uh, huge effort in the community to solve this problem. There are a couple of papers here and there, but we as the community still seem to be more interested in this attack perspective. I broke this target with 50 uh, measurements. You broke it with 47, so you are better. But now I break it with 45, so I'm again better. It, I do feel we are still unfortunately a little bit more in, in that, in that uh, setup. So even if we are close until more people starts to really go into this, into metrics, we will stay far because people are not doing it. So I see no further question. There, uh, there is a comment from Padaki. Yeah, it's a comment uh, to your previous question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Indeed, MLP works great. Uh, but yeah, in in I do feel it's it's very important uh, question. But uh, you also need to understand we as the community are young, uh, deep learning and side channel. Uh, we are behind machine learning community. So you know uh, things like this uh, this pro uh, proving of uh, Lipschitz continuous function here there. This is something. We, we saw also the moment when machine learning community was more mature. And in one way, it's more, it's more realistic to expect results like this when side channel community and in deep learning becomes more mature, when we get also more people from machine learning community to help us, because these concepts are also very difficult. I mean, very difficult, very difficult for people that not necessarily have background in machine learning, like many crypto people don't have. So of course, uh, concepts like this can be very hard for us. We need help from machine learning community, but we also need maturity of the field. Like I said, deep learning started for us end of 2016. It's only a couple of years. Think of it uh, when, when uh, deep learning was very, started to be very popular again for image classifications, 2006, seven, eight. They have 10 years heads up in, in front of us. I do feel in five years, we will be doing amazing stuff with side channel and deep learning, but we still have a couple of good years of very important things we need to show, to find before we can say, okay, now we are really somewhere amazing to be. And now we are really mature as a community. So thanks everyone for this uh, lovely tutorial. And also uh, thanks Lala for the tutorial earlier. Uh, so with this, I think we, we take a short break before uh, going to the practical session. So uh, Stefan, if you can give a short teaser uh, to the audience, like what to expect after the break. So uh, Leila, you are, I think, better for, for that. <laughs> so, um, so your um, exercise will combine uh, what Stepan and me talked about. So we're gonna check if you really listened. So we're gonna give you a data set of, for ECC implementation, which you can try to attack by profiled attacks and uh, uh, when using template attacks as well as deep learning. And uh, Omid will guide you through this. So maybe we can already start by sharing some uh, information. I think uh, Omid has PDF uh, about the exercise. Maybe that's the easiest to share through Discord and some links and stuff. So um, I'm looking at uh, Space Host Hardware IO guys. Was their Discord channel already communicated? Or? Yeah, the Discord channel is already actually quite active. Okay, I didn't get it. It was not in Zoom, right? Uh, they shared. I, I will reshare the link again, or, or I'll ask the host to actually share it here. Mm -hmm. So I think the easiest would be uh, yes, it's here. I got it. So then, in that case, we. Uh, we come back uh, to start with the exercises in uh, after 10 minutes. Is that fine? Mm -hmm. So everyone, like right now, uh, it is 34 
on my clock so maybe we can start at 45 again yeah sounds good and then we have yeah 40 minutes say if we want to finish five minutes before the official opening so, so we have please get recharged for the uh, for the next session of exercise so i think we'll be having fun okay so see you all in 10 minutes so first in Zoom, and then we'll move to, to Discord. That's what I propose. And we will share in Discord, OK?